Welcome everybody to the Best of Voices 2022. I'm Tim Blanks and after, this is our seventh year of Voices and we are as usual at Soho Farmhouse in the misty English countryside, chilly as hell as well. Uh, this is, our, Voices is an annual gathering of some of the world's great thinkers and doers. I always leave fully enlightened and um, I'm very excited today to uh, be speaking to some special guests. But before then, we're going to have a look back over the past few days. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Voices 2022, the Business of Fashion's annual gathering for big thinkers now in its seventh year. I would say don't underestimate like the incredible resilience and beauty of the human spirit under in you know, incredible hardship and adversity. Invest the time, develop your ability to seek truth and facts rather than waiting for the next meme or profile picture to fall into your lap. I think American luxury is freedom. I think it's having the freedom to wear what you want when you want to wear it and having the freedom to put on something that frees you up mentally and spiritually so that you could be the best version of yourself. And that maybe we can reimagine a world, a system, a fashion that looks and feels differently and that serves more of us. And every single year they read the latest IPCC report coming out of the UN or other scientist bodies saying we're pretty much getting nothing done. They rationally conclude that this is kind of a heist. But you know, it's, it's not um, borrowing, it's stealing from the future to me. You know, and I, and I think we've got everything sort of upside down. One of the most worrying aspects of our modern digital world, the digital divide. Take a deep, focused breath with me. We're going to close our eyes, breathe in for four, hold for four, and breathe out for four. Let's go. Now, you, you saw one of my guests tonight in that clip there. Uh, Ziad Ahmed is the chief executive of Juve Consulting. He spoke to us yesterday about why Gen Z is so angry, but he has a huge big smile right now, so right. I'm waiting to see what he has to say tonight. Our other guest is Stephanie Simon, who is the former head of community at Clubhouse. Now, you've, Stephanie, you've been here before. You're a, you're a Voices veteran. What do you expect every year when you come? This is my sixth year, which is kind of nuts. Um, I always expect, and this is actually what I love about it, there's such diversity of voices, and that's why it's called voices. And I think not just the perspectives, but it's not, as Imran said the first day, this isn't meant to be fashion, talking about fashion with people in fashion. And I think that everyone walks away with this weekend, both with enlightenment, as you said, but really deep relationships that I think bring unexpected collaborations following this. That's certainly happened in my life, and I think it's happened in many people's lives after Voices. You made a very good point there that I should have made at the beginning, that, that we are the business of fashion, but this event itself, mm. fashion is often quite marginal. Mm. I mean, it's in our minds, but uh, what we're talking about are the world's big, definitive mm. issues. Uh, Zia, this is your first time. Yeah, it so, is. So, um, bearing in mind that you're coming to an event hosted by the Business of Fashion, yeah. have you been surprised? Have you been enchanted? What, what has happened to you over the past few days? Yeah, I mean, I guess my biggest expectation walking in is that I would, like, be horribly underdressed. <laughs> um, like, underqualified in my attire to even be here. Uh, and so I think that was my biggest anxiety, walking into uh, such an esteemed, um, you know, site and source of fashion. Um, I have been surprised, I think, at how much fashion has been at the margin of a lot of the conversations. And obviously, you know, fashion is an integral part of our everyday, right? It's what we're wearing, it's, it's everywhere. And so I think it's been really beautifully weaved into a lot of the stories that we're telling and a lot of the discourses that we're convening around. But I've been really moved at how expansive this conversation has been and has become. And I sort of expected maybe, um, I don't know, a very like New York Fashion Week vibe, if that makes sense. And yeah. that has not at all been my experience. I think my experience has been that this is less a networking conference and, and less a, a runway and more, you know, a, a real convening of, of deep, intellectual, meaningful conversations. And, and it's not about how many people you meet, but about the few deeper, meaningful relationships that you walk away with. And I think there's something 
so beautiful and profound uh, about the space that you guys have really wonderfully curated and convened. And I'm just, I feel really lucky to be here. Well, I'm so happy to hear that because <laughs> you're, you're not, you're not uh, unique in feeling that you, you know, thinking about w what you're going to wear yeah. to this thing. But and look at you in your patchwork jacket. It yeah. looks great. Yeah. And you had your no, jacket. next you had to your... you guys, I'm, I'm trying to just hold my own. No, you had your message jacket on yesterday. Yes, yeah, it had well. to be on brand. I had to be yeah. on brand. On brand, yeah, yeah, on yeah. brand. Now, um, uh, your, your talk yesterday was about why Gen Z is so angry. And we began the day with um, uh, some, some very esteemed news yeah. journalists yeah. talking to us about uh, the state of the world right now. And uh, it, it became very, um, I was very clear, I think, to everybody why uh, young people are yeah. frustrated and furious about the world that is being bequeathed to them yeah. by their elders who yeah. in many cases have completely lost the plot. Yes. Um, after that brush with cold, hard reality, we fight our way back to a position of, um, well, hope perhaps, or at least seeing what pe idealistic people, passionate people yeah. are doing to address these issues in the world. Uh, I was very impressed by Mo Goodat, mm. who spoke to us about AI. Um, let's just have a look at him, and then we'll talk about what he had to say afterwards. When they will not only have emotions, they will have more emotions than we do. Please understand that. Just like as, as we have more emotions than a jellyfish, because we can contemplate concepts like the future, and so we can have hope and optimism and so on, they will have more emotions than us, because they have more cognitive bandwidths. And humanity has only agreed three things. Wherever we are, from all of the speeches that we've heard today, we've agreed, all agreed that we want to be happy. We want to have the conditions to find our happiness. We will have compassion in us to make those we care about happy. By the way, if, you, if you're a drug dealer and you only care about your daughter, you still have the compassion to want to make her happy, right? And we all want to love and be loved. So, AI. This was Mo's vision of AI. Stephanie, how did that sit with you? I, I actually think it tied really closely with the last speaker today as well. Um, Imran, who's the founder of Humane. I, I think that this idea, um, I loved also the point that we didn't show, but that he made about us being the mommies and daddies of AI. And that if we don't illustrate what behaviors we want sort of AI to, and the, the kindness and the love that we want to admit out into the world, then AI won't either. And I think that it, it becomes a really interesting reckoning and lesson for us as humans as we sort of um, go throughout our day. Um, you know, and, and how we can be instructed to the AI. And I think that, again, that's what Imran was sort of driving at, which is we ultimately want to be instructive to AI. We don't want to be led by tech. We want it to be invisible and at, at service to us. And I really, I don't see that as, I, I, I know it can be overwhelming to think about the capacity and the fact that it's going to be much more intelligent than we could ever imagine and a billion times a more billion intelligent times. than a billion times. Yeah. What was the analogy he made? Yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, sort of, you know, to what, what was the analogy? Do you remember oh, no, the it? The whole notion of that we've been educated in, you know, by Arnold Schwarzenegger movies, <laughs> that the future sends back yes. a, a Terminator yes. to oh, yes. um, save us from AI, the AI that we've created. Um, that has destroyed humanity. Mm. And he said, AI won't care about humanity. Human beings will be less than a fly to AI. Yes. AI will be so advanced. And then he presented this other, this other notion that, that we teach AI by example. Mm. And, and by being ethical, kind human beings, mm. AI learns to be ethical and kind. Mm. Now, what do you think about that, Ziad? Because I, if I was 23 years old, yeah. I would look at that scenario that Mo was painting for us and think, ooh. Ooh, yeah. what? The world. Not the possible? World, world, like, or not? Or, or relying on human beings to teach by example, yeah. by kind, by teach by an example of kindness and, and, and ethical, you know, an ethical way of living. Yeah. I don't know, when I look around me right now, I don't see so much leadership based on ethics mm. and kindness. Yeah. So, Zia, you tell oh. me what you think. 
Well, I've certainly been moved by, I, I think, the number of leaders here who at least are positing, leading by you know, ethics and compassion. And, and, and perhaps there are more than I maybe previously thought, or maybe I often you know, have a preconceived notion about. But I think often in, in my work and in my role, you know, talking about Gen Z, there's often an assumption that, that Gen Z is like leading the charge towards this innovation. Mm -hmm. And like Gen Z is the first adopters and the most bullish on Web3 and where the internet is headed and AI and all of these things. And I think broadly speaking, that's not really the case. But mm -hmm. I think broadly speaking, a lot of young people, to your point, are really skeptical and, and critical about our own relationships to technology, about the technology companies that currently dominate the market uh, and about, to your point, leadership broadly and who's in mm. charge. And I think that there's oftentimes this conflation of innovation and progress. This idea that business, right, that leadership, that industry tells us this is new so it is better. And I think that it was rightfully sobering to hear folks walk through the ways in which a lot of these new technologies perhaps have the promise to make us better mm. but at present are not, right? And really are, I think, eloquently displaying and, and articulating that tension point that if the right people were creating, if the right people were leading, then perhaps these technologies could serve us, could serve the many. I am deeply skeptical that that is the case. You know, in, in my experience, I, I am still most often the only young person in the room. And, and most of the rooms that I operate look nothing like me or the communities that I care about or love or come from um, or that my friends come from. And, I think that there, what, what is dangerous, it's not, it's not only to me about are the people leading it demonstrating ethical behavior because people have different codes of ethics. Mm. It's about do the people creating represent the ethical codes of the most marginalized among us? And I think most often the answer to that question is no, especially, especially in technology conversations. And so, inshallah, God willing, the right people are given the reins to create a technology that works for us, but you are right to believe that I am deeply skeptical of that future. And well, promise. let's look at uh, one of the other speakers from t uh, one of the speakers from today. Um, not definitely not Gen Z, but she had a message that was, mm. I thought, quite clear-eyed. It was. She's very pragmatic. Yeah. She um, talks about. Some, a theme that came up a few times, the notion that, that this sort of ethical approach has to be mandated. Mm. It can't be voluntary. Mm -hmm. It has to be legislated. Yeah. And companies have to be held to account. Obviously, I'm talking about Baroness uh, Lola Young. You can reel off all of these things, and what's the, what's the average citizen to know? What, what do even I know when I see all these figures? And that's why I think regulation has to step in for all the reasons that we said about needing to be systemic change. But that systemic change also has to happen within governments because they're in thrall to certain kinds of businesses in whose interest it is to keep mining fossil fuels and, and all the rest of it, exploiting labour as actually has been done for hundreds of years. So it's really that we've managed to refine this system to work to um, the benefit of a relatively small number of people who are ageing, like myself, as we're all ageing. But, you know, it's, it's not um, borrowing, it's stealing from the future, to me. You know, and I, and I think we've got everything sort of upside down. Stephanie, how did you find the Baroness's speech. Um, sobering, but honest. I think that what was interesting, not just that someone from the public sector is sort of saying this, but from the public sector, from a private sort of company, from a public company, and from the financial sector. All four of these people were sort of in agreement on, about on this. On panel. Yeah, about this need for regulation. And I think that uh, sort of a mandate, it's really difficult to probably mandate a code of ethics into who's going to develop sort of technology, but it seems much more straightforward to mandate the targets that we're going to need in order to ensure, you know, a progress from a climate change perspective. And to me, um, you know, I'm, I'm an American, but big, big fan of uh, big government. <laughs> you know, As am I, I. Yeah, and I think that that is really, uh, that is sort of the answer, and I think that she's spot on, and I think this idea of stealing from the future, you know, I think you're, we're, I think technically we're in the same, we're close to being in the generation, you're Gen Z, I'm barely millennial, but I, but I think this same attitude of just... Um, I'm hopelessly boomer. 
No, you're thrivingly boomer. You're fantastically boomer. Yeah, yeah, you're like thrivingly <laughs> boomer. Yeah, but I, I think that, you know, I think what she's saying is honest but true. And I think that the fact that we had a, a broad range of um, backgrounds in an agreement on this is indicative, hopefully, of where we're going. But the question is, how quickly can we get there? OK, what, what do you, watching her, and Stephanie's right, that panel was, uh, was uh, people from a range yeah. of different, of different um, areas, private, public. When you see people like her, and you, uh, you can feel how fierce she is. Yeah. Mm. You can feel how fierce she would be. Mm. Um, how, how do you feel? I, I mean, you, you, you talk, the, 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 Mo, Mo leaves you with deep skepticism. Then you see somebody, I mean, obviously, legislating AI. It yeah. just feels like yeah. trying to put a bees in a box. But, mm. but what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think my biggest takeaway, you know, from being here and from hearing these conversations is I think the leaders and the solutions to the problems that we are facing exist. Mm. It's a question is, is, are the people who currently have the reins willing to give them up, mm -hmm. right? And are the people who have the fuel to power the engines that we know can run willing to provide that fuel, right? And I am so convinced that we can if the political will, if the financial will, if the social will exists, can tackle these massive problems that we are facing. And, and, I, and I especially believe that to be true because of the tremendous young activists and organizers from diverse communities who inspire me and teach me and call me in every single day who are following in the footsteps of incredible leaders who've spoken truth to power against incredible odds, who've surmounted barrier after barrier after barrier in the hopes that maybe we can shift the needle a little bit. But I think what I've also heard reiterated throughout this time is like, the time is now. Yeah. Yeah. Like we don't have much time to yeah. keep shifting the needle a little bit. We gotta swing that shit. Like really urgently and dramatically. And so my only hope is that, you know, coming away to your point about unexpected collaborations, like make her prime minister. You know, like, <laughs> like what are we waiting for? Like if we know that they're, you know, you know if we know that the, the leaders exist, mm -hmm. Let's do everything that we can to get them the reins. I mean, the, 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 the issue, one of the issues that, that has come up, um, watching people talk about creating housing, watching people mm. talk about creating economic opportunities for the excluded in the world, um, is that, that the, their, their passion, the commitment to their projects is really inspiring. But over, over everything, there's this umbrella of climate of the climate crisis, which these people are talking about. And it, you know, like you said, action now, because it actually is kind of already too late. You talked yesterday actually about this idea of the tension sort of of holding both yeah. seemingly opposing ideas. And I think that you just touched on this like, this desire for human self-actualization and for this desire for us to reach our potential, whether it's because you've been impoverished or whatever, versus the larger narrative of like, yeah, 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 you, we, don't, we want everyone to feel self-actualized except for everything's burning, the world is burning. And I think that these, these yeah. ability to hold both of these ideas is, is challenging, but I think it's actually quite related, even what we were talking about the ethics, which is the great leaders who will lead and will help sort of mommy and daddy, the AI, they need to be self-actualized. They must be. And so in order for more of us to, to sort of educate and be mummies and daddies to the AI, we all need to be as self-actualized as possible, which means we leverage all these technologies, et cetera. But I do think that there is this over, there's these sort of contradicting ideas, which is like the world is burning, but me, I need to get it self-actualized. Yeah. It's, it's really fascinating, I think. And, and, the, and, the, and even here, mm. the, the opposing voices, they're not, they're not, not, they're not in opposition. No. but they are saying very different things. Mm. I mean, I, I really love watching um, Tariq Fancy as mm. well because something else that comes through in the last few days and always at Voices is people who've jumped the fence, people mm. who've been working for big yeah. business or, yeah. or, or in high finance or yeah. something who have a 180-degree change in their lives and start working for change. Yeah. And Tariq is one of those people. Mm. So let's have a clip of him. We're going to need more clean players, right? This sport needs more clean players. So there's a lot of in people in this room who are leaders. It is more expensive. It is harder. It's going to be difficult going into a tough economic period. But we're going to need to provide some examples of how play, play can be clean. And in part, that's for the second reason. So we can go to governments and tell them that, listen, we need regulation. 
because number one, individual action is not going to aggregate enough, right? Nice people using paper straws is not going to do it. Right? We need it to be systemic. It has to be everyone. Number two, it can't be voluntary. It has to be mandatory. And I think if we couch that trying to play clean and leading the way with a very honest message that it's pretty much time to call on the refs because otherwise we're not going to be able to create the kind of systemic change required, then I think we actually have a chance of turning the tide this decade. So that is the theme, the, 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 man, the legislated change. I mean, it, it has to be. Um, he, he, he spoke about uh, a lot of other things in, in his talk. I mean, uh, I, I found, I find, I find people when they've, as I said, jumped the fence, I find we them We call really it the zeal of the converted. There's no yeah. zeal like that of the converted. But they also know the enemy. <laughs> totally. totally. Yeah. yeah. So what, did you, what do you make of somebody like him when, when mm. you see, uh, when, you, when he actually does have mm. ideas that are workable, as he points out, expansive? You know, and, and you're hitting shareholders where it hurts. So, you know, this is, this is a huge challenge. I mean, I think he's absolutely right, that I think a lot of these things, to me, come back to this idea that we need system-level change. Right? And system-level change is really hard to accomplish for a plethora of reasons. One, I think that when we often talk about things in system-level change, then a lot of people divorce themselves from culpability, which is why, like, in my talk, I reference this idea that, like, we have to hold ourselves to account. Because in many ways, like, we are the system. Right? Especially when we are convening, to your point, the thinkers and doers of our time. To what extent are we a reflection of the system and are we accountable to have to change such that it lays the groundwork that we can make those pivots, right? That we can make that fence not just jumped, but completely toppled over, right? And I think for me, yes, like I am a big advocate of political and legislative change, but it's really hard, especially when systems were actively constructed to marginalize and silence the voices of many. And there's a lot of democratic institutions and reforms that are necessary to be completely, completely recalibrated if we are meaningfully to think about these problems, right? Because the problem is the people who have power right now are incentivized to not do these things, right? Have every incentive in the world to keep, you know, getting their dividend at the end of the year, to keep, you know, running on these two-year terms, right? And, and, and campaigning constantly and not doing the system level change, but instead doing the bright, shiny thing that gets them reelected two years later, right? And doing the incendiary thing to get them elected the next two years later. And so for me, like, what we need to see, I think, is us holding ourselves to account. And also, I think sometimes what we do a poor job about, or even I do a poor job about, is prioritizing. Like, we talk a lot about, you know, the, the, this, maybe the superficial or, or, or the top of the problem instead of the root. And I think what a lot of these questions and conversations come to is, like, we have to tackle the root, which is, like, how are people voting? Whose voices are at the table? What is the system? And how can we pick a way at it to, re to fundamentally change it? Because for me, only then will we have the space to even make some of this change happen. What do you think about, about the, the sentiment that was expressed by, I think maybe it was even Tariq, actually, talking to uh, uh, young people who, younger people, mm. who said, we don't want to change the system. We want to jettison the system. Yeah. You know, yeah. if, if something, you know, it's so broken. Yeah, it's not broken. What? It's working exactly as designed. Yeah. Well, but that, I actually think that was a bit of the elephant in the room, that, that he didn't talk at all about what if we just shift the targets away from a growth economy all the time, and then if we didn't always have to hit the profits yeah. that the yeah. shareholders are demanding, maybe things could actually change. Yeah. And I'm not going to sit here, I'm not totally Gen Z, and I'm not no, no. a socialist, but I do think that that's an important point. Like, the elephant in the room is also, in addition to their you know, needing to be rules that are changed, because I think that's what he was essentially doing. He used a lot of sports analogies, which I love as a former basketball player. But I think that the other rules that need to be changed are the ones that are requiring the CEOs and the executives of all these companies that have to hit targets for their shareholders. Yeah. They're making bad decisions. They're the ones that are saying 80% of their decisions are greenwashing because they have to hit targets. That was pretty, pretty amazing. They, no one touched on that. And yeah. as, a former yeah. finance, I mean, as a former finance person myself, I was like, this is the thing nobody wants to talk about. Yeah, CEOs who admit that, yeah. that the sustainability uh, the sustainability practices. It was seventy percent in America. Yeah. It was seventy yeah. no, percent in America. It's mind-boggling, but but I think 
to, to yeah. that point, I think a lot of young people are righteously, totally. right, looking at the world and saying this can't be the best that we can do. Mm. And these systems are not broken. They're working exactly as they were designed, right, to privilege the few and not the many. Like, that's why they were constructed, and that's how they were constructed. And so, you know, it comes back to Audre Lorde's quote that gets quoted in activists and organizing circles all the time. Like, you cannot tear down the master's house with the master's tools. Like, we are trying, in many ways, in many cases, to use the tools that were made to subjugate folks, to try to tear down the system that was created to subjugate folks. And so, I think it's hard to imagine. What would a system look like that's oriented on a different axis and maybe impossible in some cases to even conceive of, but I think we have to, mm -hmm. unless we have the political imagination, unless we have uh. the, the, the gall to at least orient ourselves to what it could look like, I don't think we're gonna move the needle far enough, right? Because whatever is the utopia that we're imagining, it should be a damn good one, because I'm a big believer in like, we shoot for the moon and we land amongst the stars. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting you, you say that because one of the speakers today was a woman called Dame Stephanie Shirley. Yeah. And she's 90. Yeah. And she has, she has made successful businesses by basically not, I mean, ignoring the system, creating mm. her own as, as a woman working in tech. Yeah. At the very beginning of tech, almost, yeah. before 1960s, Facebook. Yeah, crazy. I mean, incredible. And, and being very, very successful with it. it. Completely inspirational. She got the big standing yeah. O of yeah. the day. She deserves so let's it. Have, let's have a look at her. But the more worrying divide today is between the corporate and institutional haves who dictate the terms of the online world with their extraordinary power and influence. And the have-nots, the vast majority of common internet users trying to navigate uh, an environment in which it can be hard to know what and who is the truth. Mm. OK, end of the day. Um, what's your, as Imran was doing it with the audience before, earlier, what was your takeaway for the last, from the last few days? Oh, um, I actually think the clip that you just showed was something that really resonated deeply with me as but the woman that works in technology and is sort of building another company within technology. Um, it's really, really important that the people who are shaping this next world, whether we call it a metaverse or just like the internet generally as our next world, that the people building it are, are reflective and sort of different from potentially the patriarchy, yeah. white people that built our real world and conquered other nations and sort of didn't have a collaborative nature. I think that it's really, really important that we have women and underrepresented people helping build the, that next world. And I think she was, she was kind of touching on that, but that was one of my biggest takeaways because it's something I think about a lot and I think it's radically important in ways that maybe we don't fully comprehend that the, this world on the internet and digitally is very, very similar to just back in the days when humans settled and, and became civilized on this planet. And I think that we have to, in order to avoid the same problems, we have to have a different set of people building it. Yeah. Ziad, your reaction? Yeah, I mean, I think connecting back to your point about this idea of people disagreeing about how we ought to make change, I think one of my biggest takeaways is that I think it will take a lot of us mm. with a lot of different viewpoints come from a lot of different backgrounds to make the change that we want to see in the world. And what I mean by that is like, what I am moved by in being here is look at the gains that science has made and look at the gains that fashion has made and look at the gains that politics and regulation has made and look at the gains that different folks have made in different circles. And I don't think there's any one way of making change that will save us, mm. right? I, and, and, and look, I'm, I am hopeful, but maybe skeptical if we can save us, but I am hopeful. But my hope stems from this belief that if we more equally distribute opportunities such that more people can become those scientists and more people can become those politicians and more people can be those leaders from those represented communities and come together and, and not say, oh, you're, doing, you're solving the problem wrong. My way is the right way. Instead saying, how can we work together to, right, to tackle the root from our various different disciplines? Then, perhaps, we can unleash the power of our collective voices oh. to achieve better. OK, so we have a plan of action from days one and two. I don't know about all that. <laughs> maybe, maybe. I think he has a plan for all the things, so I'm really into that. it. We, it's, we, can, we can say that that's a positive note yeah. um, from days one and two. Uh, we have day three tomorrow. We'll see you back here at the end of tomorrow. Uh, thank you very much, you two. Oh, thank you. Thank, yeah, you. thank you for Goodbye having from us. Voices 2022.